And we are back with another episode of the Hockey Princess podcast. I am your host, the Hockey Princess. We got crusty old guy once again. Uh, just as a reminder, make sure to hit that like and subscribe on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube, however you watch or listen to us ramble on a weekly basis. If you have any questions about really anything hockey related, um, we love questions. Uh, make sure to, you know, you can email us at the Hockey Princess at Gmail, send us a message via Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you name it, we're probably on it. Um, let's get into it. It was a very busy week in the NHL world. Um, one of the main things that happened this past week is the NHL Combine, um, which is essentially a bunch of teenagers doing weird physical activities in front of a bunch of grown men and kind of getting critiqued about it. But my favorite part of it is every beat reporter, journalist, whatever, from where whatever city um, gets on Twitter and gossips like a 16-year-old girl. And it's very fun to watch because there's a lot of weird questions thrown out. A lot of the players go into interviews with different teams, depending on all sorts of different things. Um, and it's just a lot of weird questions come out. Um, you get to know some of the top picks a little bit more. Um, but there's just a lot of people speculating a lot of you know things that could happen and a lot of wild far-fetched concepts yes i'm glad you uh participated in some of that i don't believe i looked at any of it um do they skate no not to my understanding um but because i i didn't see anybody skating um which was the big thing because a lot of people are like with ivan demidov having his thing the week before the draft they're like but he's not skating i'm like well neither is anyone who went to the combine but i think with him it's a little bit more scary because he's not skating due to a potential injury where i just don't think that the nhl combine has a skating portion it's just a lot of weird jumps and running and going on a track uh, on a bike Okay, because, yeah, I haven't researched this as much, and then I've heard people discuss how this guy's ranked really high, this guy isn't, and but we're ranking hockey players not on skates. Yeah, it's, I kid you not, it's watching a bunch of 17-year-olds just jump in the air and get on a stationary bike, and it's days of it. But... I, I understand football that because in football they run, they catch, but the big thing in hockey is Skate. is skating, right? Yeah. So I, I, I get how you want to sit down. You'd like to talk to your draft picks. It's a way to get them all there without being too funny, but I don't, I don't see how you would be unbelievably shocked at the way people are somehow good at the combine or bad obviously that's nothing that you would be taking into too much of an effect yeah. of going oh my god this guy's gonna go up the boards now because he can jump yeah that's why i i never try to take the combine stuff too seriously i just like it from an entertainment value um but i also do like it to get to know some of the picks a little bit more maybe ones that you know either play in europe or play you know in leagues that aren't as ex easily accessible to the general public like the big 10 is in the midwest um it's definitely you know a way to like put more of a personality to a name and a face that you've been analyzing their stats all year, sort of a thing. Um, my favorite, as I promised, I will bring up, I will bring him up every week, was Artie the Sparty. Guys, he's actually funny. Um, there were a lot of big talks and now everyone's kind of being like, well, Kyle's gonna draft Lashuna off um, because he was talking about how they took him out to dinner. They've gone up to Michigan State quite a bit. Um, they've met with him a lot. Um, and he just, he, he definitely, you know, turned on the charm a bit, not completely, but like tried to make jokes in front of the media um and definitely was one of the few that wasn't complete like robot in front of a press 
or in front of the press, um, which I thought was nice because I always like to see that because um, this has got to be pretty intimidating. I mean, just in general, it's got to be a weird couple of, you know, months leading up to the draft, especially if you're a high pick. Um, so to have the ability to like be a little bit looser in terms of, you know, your confidence. Yeah, I would assume as far as um, Lashinov, um, interview-wise, he's probably not as polished as like a uh, uh, Macklin Celebrini who's spent so many years now getting himself ready for those straight-ahead yeah. answers. Don't give anybody too much because that's the way mm -hmm. hockey players are. So. so that's really nice to see from him. Um, as far as the, you know, now the winds are turning towards Lashunov as the number two. Yeah, I had heard something that, you know, nobody's positive of Ivan's injury. There's now chatter that he, Ivan might sign another contract. This is going to continue till draft day. All it takes is one semi mouthpiece to breathe anything into the Ivan story and the needle will move one way or the other. All it will take is now tomorrow, somebody else going, no, I've talked to people and he, he's thinking, you know, he might not even go his last year and then the needle will move back. Nobody really knows. That's why um, I said the combine is essentially a bunch of grown men getting on Twitter, gossiping like 16 year old girls. Yes. And I'm on Twitter now, but I really yeah. didn't pay much attention. Um, yeah. So it was cool to see some of the top picks get a little bit more. You get to see them a little bit more. Um, really the only one that wasn't really that present at the combine was Tampa, but as a lot of people noted over the past week, you know, the Tampa Bay lightning don't pick until the fourth round, you know, this is not a solid draft year in terms of picks for them. They need to be a little bit present, but not completely like, you know, Chicago where you have a ton of draft picks and really need to be completely in the know of every little detail of these kids. Yeah. Um, but again, it, it, it's a way to start talking to them. You can have sit downs with them. Um, I guess you can learn certain things from an interview. Um, again, as far as these top 20, you know, this is make or break like it. Utah so. asking Artie what his Uber rating was and says, I bike everywhere on campus. <laughs> he said, yeah, which I is, have Uber. <laughs> which is a darn good answer for, you know, somebody to be saying. Yeah. So, uh yeah, the rest of it, I, it's just I don't think it holds as much water as any of the other combines. It is a good way for them to get together. Um, I'm sure it's a good way for them to go over behavior at the draft and maybe start, you know, opening them up to them what NHL life is about. I don't, I, I just, but I don't know really. Yeah, we just speculate here. Um, so that happened this week. Um, which we'll get back to the draft in a hot minute, but then we have to get to quickly. We'll just gloss over, um, you know, hockey princess has a corner that she doesn't put a ton of people in really. That's mainly Krusty's thing. And it's also been a while since. How do you get a corner? Because, okay. Can we put them in your corner or do I need to have my own corner for this? You gotta have something else besides a corner, a dungeon or whatever. Pick something bad. A well, big black hole. you're the witch. So what do what do witches do? You can put them in the brew. You can put them in the dungeon. You gotta figure out something besides a you corner. Don't... Even though I am sure I stole the corner from eight hundred other people. All right, we got a dungeon, and unfortunately, guys, the Washington Capitals are in the hockey princess dungeon um for those who don't know the washington capitals bought capfriendly.com and the whole entire hockey world aside from the people on the washington capitals payroll and the nhl's payroll um hate it for those who have not been on cap friendly it is a very 
informational website. It breaks down a ton of things. Um, it pr essentially breaks down, you know, the cap limit, everybody's contracts when they're up if they're going to be an unrestricted free agent, restricted free agent, as well as guys that are in the pipeline that maybe have an NHL contract, but they're down, for instance, like Chicago prospects that are down in Rockford that come up back and forth quite a bit, like in Isaac Phillips, that's all very much laid out there. Um, if anybody's on injured reserve, if there's any dead space or buyout, it's all listed. It's all incredibly transparent. Um, and the NHL basically thinks that the public doesn't need to know that. Um, they don't need to know any of this information. And that's kind of why they were okay with the Washington Capitals buying Cap Friendly. Um, I will say Cap Friendly is it, it's one of my favorite sites that I use. And I still use it even with Hawk stuff that, you know, I probably should know. But it's a great it's a great, incredibly like informative website. And it's definitely a helpful website for folks that are either trying to get into the sport or trying to understand aspects from a financial or a contract perspective. Because so that website also breaks down, you know, what is the difference between an unrestricted free agent and a restricted free agent, which is a question that Krusty and I get all the time. Or are they arbitration eligible? What all does that mean? You know, it's a great way for people to learn more aspects about the NHL. And the NHL has basically said, public doesn't need to know that. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of anyone saying that, you know, they should be withholding that type of information, um, especially when it helps, you know, new fans or fans that aren't completely new, but are trying to learn more aspects of the game from if and it prohibits them from learning that. I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, it originally set up with a <clears throat> the guy had Cap Geek, and um, he did it for like twenty years, all of his own stuff. Um, and then he was stricken by cancer, and then ended up selling it to this group, and then they basically continued on with it. So it's been a non-hockey person that's done all of this. Um, I listened to a little bit of uh, 32 Thoughts, thoughts uh, Freeman, and he was surprised at how much some NHL teams rely on this site. Um, that's a little weird. I figure if you're an NHL team, you would also want all of this information to be somehow set up in-house. It shouldn't be that difficult. Um, I, I see, I see the sites that are out there now probably stepping up their game to make sure they, cause one of these sites is going to be the site that everybody comes to yeah. because everybody needs the information. I mean, I was, I'm able to take any RFA person and decide if, uh, they decide to buy them out. What's, what's it, what does that look like? Yeah. And boom. It gives me 11 years at 1.4. It, it's a phenomenal place. So I have not gone around the new place. The The one that I've been told about is puckpedia.com. Um, I haven't looked around because I would assume I'll continue to use cap key. You need something. It's gone. And then I'm going to have to go find something else. Um. What the Washington Capitals are doing with it, I don't know. I, there can't be a patent on how they get their information. It's basically information. I just, I don't see the need to buy it. Yeah. But uh, again, if you think you're putting other clubs at a disadvantage, Oh, man, I, I got to figure another site pops up before the beginning of the next season. That is just as solid. Yeah. So. So the one that we will be using, I uh, once Cap finally gets taken down, is Puckpedia, and then if another one pops up, like Krusty said, we'll let you guys know, um, because we're all about spreading information, unlike the NHL. Yeah. Well. I... 
I mean, the NHL's got nothing to do with the guy is allowed to sell. His no, product. I'm I'm more talking about Gary Bettman saying this is okay because the public really doesn't need to know any of this. I don't. That's the issue that I have. A, that's the thing that I have a problem with, is him saying, "Well, they really didn't need to know this in the first place." It's yeah. a way to understand aspects of the game. You know, Joe well, Smo yeah. from the Burbs is not going to do a ton of you know damage to a particular team by having this information. For me, it's a way to understand aspects of the game. Right, and it gives everybody a chance to be fantasy GM. And and yeah. our salary cap is different than anybody else's. It's being a hard cap changes the ball game. Teams are stuck paying that amount. Well, to the most point, unless you're, you know, your Tampa Bay, your Vegas, your other teams. But um, so it, 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 you know, it's a way for everybody to look and go, okay, we can do X, Y, and Z with the limited amount of resources we have. And again, something else will pop up that'll be just as good, hopefully. And because cap, Friendly was unbelievably user friendly. Yes, it was very user friendly. All right, we're gonna move past the dungeon and go back to the draft. Um, last week we told you guys that we'd be looking at all of the potentials that are around when the Hawks are picking. Um, I'm gonna say I definitely did not do research for the sixth and seventh round. Um, that's on me. But we've got quite a bit of information for you guys. Um, so number two is going to be what we've been saying for the past month or so. It's already the Sparty or it's Ivan Demidov. Um, you know, a lot of people are throwing out crazy other different scenarios. I don't think it's Caden Lindstrom as much as I would still be kind of okay with that because the thought of a prospect that could actually just be a centerman does make it a little exciting. It's Demidov or it's Lishinov. Yeah, um, yeah, there's been a tiny bit of chatter and Lindstrom's come back in. You know, the back is all basically okay. Yada 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 yada. I I think it's between Ivan and Lishunov, but again, could they take another defenseman? Sure. I don't that gap between Lestrunov and even Dickinson, how big is it? Right. I wouldn't say it's huge. I just, as I've stated before, I believe in Lestrunov's ceiling. Yeah. I think he um, has just started. Who does, who picks at four? I forgot. Uh, Anaheim goes three. Montreal four. goes five. That would put your Columbus Blue Jackets in at four. See Caden Lindstrom going to Columbus, unfortunately for him. Well, yeah, there's Lindstrom and then there's defenseman. Um, yeah. you know, the other thing at two. Do they go completely off board and do they take the other Russian? Do they take the huge defenseman that you've talked about a little bit, Aggie Prince? And Tonsilia. Um, you know, who could be a premier. Shut down defenseman for uh oh, what helicopter's coming? Oh, snap, that wasn't a UFO, it's just a helicopter. Maybe it was a UFO. Um, from you know, <laughs> some of the stuff that I'm hearing, that wouldn't surprise anybody. There's enough people out there to say he could be the best defenseman in the draft. And like I said last week, I mean, Siliev has really been projected two to seven. Um, and is probably the biggest wild card on the top 10 aspect that, you know, could he could really go anywhere because the thought of a six foot seven defenseman entices essentially nine teams out of the top 10. Who can skate, who can skate and who's pretty doggone fast. Yeah. Again, like Ivan, uh, those players don't grow on trees, so I. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so we've got a lot of things happening at two potentially. 
Um, and then number 18 pick um, that we upgraded. We originally had number 20 upgraded with the New York Islanders. Um, I've got a couple of names. Um, first one is kind of the one that I'm thinking is the way that Chicago goes for it. And that is your Michael Haig from the Chicago Steel. Um, he is projected, he will be going to the University of Michigan next fall. Um, he is a projected, he's a, labeled as a centerman right now, but a lot of people are thinking that it's going to be like a Connor situation where it could easily just slide to a winger as he develops um, compared to Morgan Frost, Rob Thomas. Um, missed most of the 2022-23 season um, and then was able to get back. So, you know, the fact that he had the year that he did it with the steal after missing a whole year or basically a whole year um, is pretty great. Um, let's see. He had uh, about 75 points in 54 games originally from Canada. Um, the main thing with him is the physicality needs work. However, I really think that you can say that across the board with the exception of, you know, Siliev, who's six foot seven, and Caden Lindstrom and a couple of other guys, they're all 17. Main, unless they're already huge, physicality is an aspect that needs work. And that's going to come with, you know, being in college, being in juniors more, being in rock or going to Rockford. That is going to come. Yeah. And um I mean Haig out of the other two people that they've drafted, your Oliver Moore and your Frank Names are, Haig probably has a better shot at being a centerman than either of those two. I I, I think I I think Michael's set up to be a centerman. He's six one. He'll probably top out about two hundred. He's used to playing center. I I think number one. I I it checks most of the boxes that the Blackhawks like. I would be completely fine with this. Um, I was fortunate enough to see him uh, in two games this past season, once against Green Bay Gamblers, because Krusty, old guy, and I went out to go see Chicago Blackhawk prospect Adam Guyon in net. Um, and then we also saw him against the USN TDP uh, U17 team. Um, guys, I was so bummed that day. I thought I was seeing the U18 team. I was so excited. I thought I got to see Eisenman, but nope, that's okay. Um <laughs> But, and I thought he looked great. I would definitely be more than okay if he's the pick at 18. Yeah. Um, Who else? Next, do you got others? I do. Um, these two, I'm not entirely sure that they'll still be here at 18. But if, you know, if it's an Oliver Moore situation where they fall quite a bit, I do think that they are people to consider. Uh, first one is going to be Liam Greentree from the OHL Windsor Spitfires. Um, he is a left winger, six foot two from Canada, averaging a point, a, a little under a point and a half per game. Um, that is with the Windsor Spitfires going through a massive rebuild. So as we've explained throughout the or throughout this past year, you know, juniors, um, be it the WHL, the OHL, the Q League, they have an age limit. Um, so there's limited amount of time for these teams to make a deep run to the Memorial Cup. Um, and, you know, there will be periods where they get rid of ev absolutely everybody um, to get draft picks for the next year so they can rebuild quickly. Um, the rebuild, you have way less time than you do on an AHL or an NHL aspect. The Windsor Spitfires are going through a massive rebuild. So the fact that he was averaging a little under a point and a half per game with a bottom-ish seed team, I find quite impressive. Um, he's able to use his physicality. He's a playmaker, needs a bit you know, more on the speed aspect, um, but he also could project it to go higher than 18. Like I said, if he's there at 18, I definitely think he's a guy to consider. Um, he, I've seen him anywhere between like 13 to 20. Yeah. Um Again, we've talked about how we kind of use elite prospects. Uh, you know, I've been told I need to expand my horizons on that. So um, I've been looking at the hockey writers. Um, their top 120. And according to, like, their top 120, he should be there at 18. So, yeah, I, th I think there's the chance that he's there. 
and if I think he, if he's there, that becomes a big he's decision for them because he's a big boy. Um, I think he's definitely something to consider. Um, another one that definitely impressed me during Worlds this past year is Michael Bramsag Nygaard from Norway. Um, he played World Juniors, Worlds, and then he was in uh, one of Norway's leagues this past year. He's a, and he really just impressed me at Worlds. And, you know, we love an underdog from a country that doesn't get as much credit as some other places. Um, he's a six foot one wing, uh, right winger. Plays a 200 foot game, has the potential to play up and down the roster, similar ish to Colton Dock, potentially, where you could peg him in different aspects, which I love those types of players um, where they could kind of fit in anywhere and it works. I think that's why teams like Dallas and Florida work so well because they have so many of those guys that could be, you know, they could fit in different aspects of the game. I think those are crucial in a rebuild. Um, great defensive skills, um, and the effort from everything that I've read is definitely there. Like I said, he impressed me during Worlds, so I think, like Green Tree, if he's there at 18, it's something to consider. It's not an easy pick to just go with Haig if he's still there. Oh, if he's still there, that I guarantee he gets picked. Really? Yes. Yes, I do not see him being there. He is your typical, except for maybe an inch short, your typical power forward. He is, he's got all the tools, a relentless four checker. If he's there at 18, they will be grabbing him. Um, I've seen him like 16 or 17, which makes me think that there could be potential for him to be at 18. Uh, yes. Because usually, I mean, you could slip to 18. It's a lot better than, you know, wishing that Carter Yakumchuk slides down eight positions where he's rumored to be 10 right now. You know, somebody could have, you know, an idea that they want this specific guy and they're going to move past the next available best player that's on the list. Um, so if he's there, I hope he's there and I hope they take it. Um, one other one, I really don't have any notes um, because I, you know, do you want to make an honorable mention? Because this, uh, there's another guy that's projected to be around the 18-ish. I highly doubt he's actually there because the Washington Capitals pick right before the Chicago Blackhawks, and I don't see them passing up on this kid. And that is your Igor Chernyshov. Um, He is a huge dude um, that plays in the SKA 1946 St. Petersburg team, um, which is where. Ovi used to play, um, massive forward, and I've definitely seen him around there. Um, so I think there's potential, but at the same time, I really doubt a wa the Washington Capitals pass on a Russian winger. Yeah, but you just, uh, you never know. Um, there's also a lot of good smaller playmakers in this draft, and they might want to go with something a lot flashier yeah. um, instead of going with their usual size. I've basically skimmed over them. I'll be honest in like the top 25. I can't see the Blackhawks going with another five ten guy. I just, it would, it would blow my mind. And there's a couple good five tenors in the top 20, but I can't see them making that decision at 18 to do that. So there's the possibility of the Russians there. That'll be another one where it's the constant. It interesting. Yes. And it's the constant Russian question. Well, when can you get them? So. And there's also, you know, on the Russian factor, it's not only when can you get them, it's that the, you know, there's definitely a different level in terms of, what GMs and what people have been able to see in terms of footage from MHL games, KHL games versus, you know, driving 90 minutes to South Bend to see a Notre Dame prospect. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So do you have anybody else on 18? Well, of course I do. 
right. What, else do what do you think I do all week? I just like hang out, don't do anything. I, I go to the gym, golf, and you know, la di da all over the place. Well, yeah, you got to practice for your golf outing with the CHGO guys. <laughs> yep, I'm going to tell them Hockey Princess says hello. Yeah. Um, yes, I've got a couple. Uh, my picks. Um, basically, I can tell you they will be there. So my first one, hold on, I got to bring him up his screen too. Is your Sasha Bozovet? Yep. Who plays for the Muskegon Lumberjacks? Um, his biggest problem is not the greatest skater. They will have to work with him. Katie has already stated. You know, that's not high on their list, but he's got everything else. Great vision. He can shoot. He is physical as all get out. And along with this other pick that I'll be talking about, the guy can play defense and he's a 6'2 centerman. And his father was a boxer. And I believe he got in at least five fights in the U. He will be a tough customer. That's what I'm looking for. I need toughness and I need defense now. I got a lot of people that are willing to skate all over the place. I need to start looking at, you know, the other things that make up the, especially an incredible middle six. So um, he's definitely one of them. He's figuring to go anywhere from 18 to maybe like 24. So I am just about positive that he would be there. Um, again, Katie has been very adamant about if your skating's a little bit of an issue, we don't want you. And I'm thinking this is the kind of guy that, hey, why don't you work with him? Right. We've got Kendall Coyne Schofield. She's on our staff. Don't we have anybody on our staff that can work with their skating? And if we don't, let's hire somebody. But um, he's one of my guys. And the other guy is somebody who now, I thought he was six foot. And now I'm being told. That he's 5'10". No, not that he's 5'10". But he's 5'11". Now let's see if I can't figure out where he's at here in my little thing. He's not completely ready at the get-go for me. Who is it? Um, the Basha. Oh, my Andrew little, Basha. Andrew Basha. Here he is. Again, another one. Fast-moving, dynamic winger with playmaking. He can skate. I was just told, no, he's really 5'11", so, but, but tomato, tomato, still not big enough. He's only a wing, but he's an incredible defensive player already. So even if his other things don't match up, he's got it. So he's actually a KD player, you know, high motor, good vision, willing to hit people. He'll be all over the place. Again, it could be a phenomenal fit for your middle six. So those are the two guys that I'm looking at, Basha. I don't know if he'll be there. But again, just starting to look through these mock drafts and the elite prospects, the hockey, this is all over the place. It really is. Um, so, you know, that'll be the fun of draft day. Yeah. So, but I'm... Um, those are the other two that I have at 18. All right. Um, you know, again, where that could change is if they take Ivan and one of these top seven defensemen falls, then I can guarantee you they'd be taking a defenseman. Yeah. So. Um, or if they go with forward for 18 again, leading into the number 34 pick, and one that was on both of our radars that we had the opportunity to see this past season um, is your Charlie Elick, 
who is a right-handed defenseman, plays in the WHL for the Brandon Wheat Kings, six foot three, physical shutdown defenseman. Um, his offensive game is kind of his weak point, but you know what? That's okay in my opinion because we have a lot of defensemen where their offensive game is their strong suit and then their defensive game is kind of their weak point right now. So to get the opposite in the pick, I don't think is the end of the world. Um, he, he's he gotten similar comments, similar-ish to Artyom Levshinov, where he's not the flashiest defenseman, but his game is effective. Um, and like with Artie, that's okay with me. I, you don't have to be the flashiest person in the world. Nicholas Jalmerson was not the flashiest defenseman, but does everyone remember him from the cup runs? Yes. Yeah, he's um, he's one of my guys. He is a thumper. Um, basically, he might make a mistake or two. You're gonna know that he's on the ice, and. You know, you reminded me that was a guy that I pointed out during the game that we watched up in Calgary. Uh, he's all over the place, making a couple mistakes, but he's lighting people up. You know, my what the drawback on him is is his outlet passes, his vision occasionally, his puck handling with the puck. They're worried going to the NHL, he's not going to be able to handle the forecheck. Um. But he's got everything else that, again, that's more coaching up. Who better to coach him up than Luke? Um, yeah. But um, he's a guy I really like because he's a, he's a D-man. And maybe EDM will be a little bit of a thumper, but this guy, it's that's his good. calling card. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you had somebody who was a number four, number five defenseman who could be with your organization for eight to ten years, that's phenomenal at the 34th pick. Yeah. So um, Another right-handed defenseman. And both of these guys, I definitely think, are contenders if Kyle goes with Demidov as the number two pick or goes with Caden Lindstrom and, you know, pigs start flying. Um, and this one, you know, am I 100% sure he will be at the third there for 34? No. I've definitely seen him from, like, 28 to – you know, the later 30s, and that's your Emery kid um, from the USM TDP, six foot three right handed defenseman, um, projected to go to the University of North Dakota for next year. Uh, potential top four D man, needs offensive skills similar to Charlie Elick. Um, but that also makes sense with the team where, where that he was on because he was on USN TDP. He did not need to be the most offensively skilled guy on that team. You know, that is kind of the calling card, in my opinion, for the USN TDP is their forwards kind of take most of the offensive responsibilities, not necessarily the demon. Um, so for that to be, you know, a thing that he needs to work on, I think it makes sense for where he was. And I think he'll definitely be, whether he's a Blackhawk or not, I think he'll definitely get more coaching on that aspect when he goes to North Dakota, um, because North Dakota is a big hockey institute. Um, and I think he'll get so, some of that coach when he goes to college next year. Great skating. I think if he's still there at 34, he's definitely an option. Yeah. Another player I like, um, yeah, he does everything you want. He's a right-handed D-man also, is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he he checks a lot of boxes. Um, And, again, he's big. You know, he's 6'3", and he's a defenseman. He's a D player. So, um, you know, he can move the puck. He can play defense really well. He's got speed. It's just he's not going to give you a lot on the offensive end, which, again, isn't the end of the world. If you're paired with Kevin Korczynski, it's not the end of the world if you're not the most offensively skilled guy, in my opinion. Like, you would want to, like, balance. Yes, you would, you, would, you would like a defenseman that is going to read off of what Core is going to do and give Core a little bit more freedom to join everything. Yeah. Um. So. So, yeah, most definitely. Uh, that's another that I would not mind at 34. So, um, 
Who else do you have at 34? Because my last one is 34 potentially could be there at 50. Is who? Yeah, he could be at 34 or 50. Um, well, I really don't have anybody else. I had those two defensemen, and then you're kind of looking for anybody with size, and there's not a there's not a ton. Um, so I I'll yeah, I don't know what I'll else we do with that. I believe the 34th pick will be dealt with anybody who slides. So if anybody yeah. slides down in this draft, they're going to grab him. Um, there's the soul bird kid who I see going at 20. And then I've seen all going all the way down to like 37. So he's another defenseman that I would think about. And your Adam Jurek, who uh, plays for the checks who played really well. Yeah. Um, all right. I've got a couple for my one. Could, it's a bit of a reach at 34, but if he's still there at 50, I would definitely say grab him. Um, and that's your Merrick Vanneker from the OHL Brantford Bulldogs. Had a fantastic season. Um, six foot winger, Brandon Sod esque with his game, which who doesn't love? Oh, hold on. Game. Hold on. My woman's leaving. All right. I'm going to keep going about Merrick Vanneker. Okay. Um, defense needs a little bit of work, um, but big brains on the kid, big brains. Um, you know, I don't see him, you know, we, I still see him being in juniors for another year or two, and that's completely fine. Um, because we have all of the time in the world when you're in a rebuild. Um, but big brains, he was unfortunately hurt during world junior, uh, under 18 this year. Um, but great year in the juniors. Um, and who doesn't love a Brandon Sod esque type of guy? Another one that is Sod esque uh, is your Max and Massey from the. I'm going to try to do this because I asked our Canadian expert about Chicotini Sanguines of the Q League. Uh, it's a six foot one winger, um, can score from anywhere. Who doesn't love to see that? Um, room to develop um which i mean really anyone at about 50 i mean really anyone there's room to develop but you know a guy who really really likes to score um so that's definitely one my last one uh for 50 was talked about a little bit from the hockey writers uh earlier this week and that is your tanner howe former connor bedard teammate of the Regina Pats. He's a 5'11 left winger, um, about 1.13 points per game, um, turns big hits into big goals, um, which I love to see a guy on the, you know, the midsize aspect to still be physical. Um, but he's a pest. He's labeled as a pest that will not go away. And as we know with Savoie being my favorite pick or prospect currently i love a pest i hate to play them but i love when we have them um not afraid of contact which is great because i just watched the chicago blackhawks basically be afraid and like they were allergic to contact this entire season so to get a guy that you know isn't necessarily afraid of contact and getting physical however you know in juniors that level is of quite a bit different. Um, they have quite a bit more rules, which is why Sam Savoy kept getting ejected when he came back from his broken femur um, because he was so physical. So we'll see. Um, definitely helps him that he's got, you know, his former teammate whispering in the GM's ear, being like, want to make me happy? Draft my friend. Um, that is really all that I have for draft picks for – now we'll have a little bit more next week uh but quickly what about mine do you have more you said you didn't have more oh crush the old guy has more okay what else do you have but go quickly oh. i need to talk about matthew kachuk what do you mean quickly i don't do anything Sorry. quickly no who are your picks All right, hold on you're gonna have to wait a second one of them is from your spitfires he is a centerman. 
AJ Spellency. S P E L L A C Y. Um, let me bring up his bio here really quick. Six three centerman. Love it. Um, he's fast and he's physical. He's raw, but he is also a kid who didn't take up hockey full time except for the last two years. He was uh, thinking of playing D1 football. So he is an athlete. He's got very good wheels, an incredible motor, and he's a big centerman. Exactly what if he's there at 50 or 60, I'm taking. He's a project, but he's one of the five, they say five, fastest straight line skaters in the draft and somebody who hasn't even begun to be coached up. So um, he is definitely somebody, if he is there at 50, I don't want them to wait and I want them to grab. He is somebody that fits perfectly for your later round picks. Who's somebody who, who still has an immense ceiling. His ceiling could be one. He could be one of those kids that you're talking about when you redraft in 15 years. He's in your first round. So that's one. I've got others. I've been doing my homework. I've been up all night smoking cigars, hanging out on the deck, going through this. And Are you buying, replying you buying? to everyone's tweets. You've become huh? a excellent tweeter. Yes. Okay. Who is my other one? Where I gotta find these guys again though. That's the problem. <laughs> Put it down on notes. Yeah, but I've got it's yes, it's Adam Jericho. You're a check. Is that how you say that? The kid with the whose brother plays in the is in the Columbus pipeline. Could be. Um J E C H O? No. no. Where's this guy at? Hold on. Let me find my people. I'm sorry that I'm the human speed bump to your show. I'll try to do better. There's also a Henry Muse that uh, is really sticking in my crawl for later picks. Okay. The Jericho kid plays for your Edmonton Oil Kings. And a little bit of bio on him. He is your 6'5". Centerman right wing, uniquely skilled, some of the best flashes in the draft, but with little in between them is what they say here. Um, good skater, good physical. His hockey sense is a little lacking. Again, a 6'5 player that needs to be coached up a little bit that maybe even could play center. It fits into what Katie's done in most of his drafts which is he's gone for talent in the early rounds, smaller players, and he's tried to load up on big players and do what I like to call the whole spaghetti thing, which for your your people, it's the spaghetti. You just take a bunch of the spaghetti, you throw it at the wall. You hope a couple of them stick, and they're actually NHL players. He's another one. And then your Spencer Gill. We'll talk about Spencer Gill just for a second, and then I'll be done. That's if I can find Spencer quickly, because I know I'm ruining your show, and you want to talk about Matthew Kachuk. I always do. I could talk about Spencer Gill next week if you'd like. No, you can just keep talking. Along with my Henry Muse. Well, next week we're going to simulate the first round and how we think it's going to go down. Okay, your Spencer Gill is a 6'4 right-handed defenseman. Love it. So, uh, impressive playmaking skills. Uh, another one who's, you know, got a high ceiling. Skating's a slight issue. So, he'd have to be coached up. He's also plays in the queue. The queue is not known for their defensemen, but where he plays... The team, which is the Romoski Oceanic, good God, 
it would really stink if crusty old guy had to do this on a show i need somebody just to fill in and translate need but he was the, he was the other one and basically you know i see right-handed defenseman that's big that has a ceiling and i go why what not in the leader rhymes okay I, i'm done now except for somebody i got at 72 and i'll throw him in next week okay um all right guys we've got two games underway with the stanley cup finals edmonton oilers versus our favorite florida panthers well our favorite for the postseason um because i am a florida panthers bandwagoner during playoffs until the blackhawks come back um florida is currently up two to nothing in the series it's been great bob has been bob and edmonton is what edmonton is um you know bob's been playing lights out first game of the finals was a shutout only let one goal in on or during game two and it was an awkward two on one situation there's not much goose can do in that situation there's not much bob can do in that situation it's just a little weird um from edmonton's aspect you know it's it's been surprising for some I always, in the back of my head, think that at some point Edmonton is going to crumble because you cannot just solely rely on four superstars to carry an entire team. As Florida saw versus Vegas, there is always going to be a team that has more depth than you. And they are going to, you know, out endurance you, outplay you, especially during the third period. The Florida Panthers have been superb in the, floor, er, in the third period. The entire you know playoffs. Um, my favorite thing when they were playing the Rangers was every commentator being like, "They need to come out in the first period and get the first goal, and they need to come out guns a blazing." Why? What they're doing is working. They don't need to change that. They're very much the can chill for the first twenty minutes and then turn it on for the final forty, and it's okay. Um, Definitely an impressive couple of games for your Evan Rodriguez, who had two goals during game two. Um, we got reports earlier today that Sasha Barkov was at practice, wow. doing full practice, um, flew with the team to Edmonton. Um, so that was great, because for those who did not see, Leon Dreisaitl landed a very nasty hit on Barkov during the second game. A lot of people were worried that he was a concussion. He was holding his jaw. I was getting Connor Bedard flashbacks. It was not fun, um, but he was at practice. And from the vague statements that Paul Maurice has made, it seems like he should, could potentially be ready to go for game three. I really hope that's the case um, because Sasha Barkov can and has been outplaying Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl the entirety of these two games. And if he's not on the ice, it's a massive hole that Florida's missing. Um, so I think, so I really hope that Barkov is healthy for game three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I can talk about Edmonton for a little bit. Do you want to talk about the hit? It was nasty. It was dirty. I still don't understand why it was two minutes um, or the, just a two minute penalty. I would like an explanation from the NHL, but we don't get that sort of thing. Because um, to my understanding, you know, if the, there's the, it looks like the body movement has the intention to jump up even a little bit and the arm is raised slightly, it's dirty. Yes. So yes. why is it just two minutes? I don't know. I cannot come up with an answer. I cannot come up, up with an answer except that it's dry sidle, why he didn't get a game. Um, the only reason is because it's Leon dry sidle. Everything that the NHL has told me the last five years is they want to take out that leading with the forearm, with the elbow. And they want to take out the lunging up. Two things that he did. And they've told me they've already taken out the leaving the feet. That's the main one that wasn't even addressed. He launched both skates off the ice before he even made the hit. 
it was deliberate. It was meant to injure. It checks every box. And I don't get too crazy with officiating. I just don't. It's playoff time. I get it. But that's the one you've told me that you can't have in the league anymore. If it's somebody besides Dreisaitl, they get a game. It's just that simple. And I understand you don't want to be coming down and giving an outcome for a Stanley Cup final by telling people they can't play. I do well, get that part of it. There should be consequences for your actions. Yes. And everything on that hit just was dirty. It was nasty. It was meant to injure. He was frustrated. He saw an opportunity to hit him and he took it. Um, I liked Florida's response, which we're going up two games and nothing. We are not going to go mental over this. We are not going to let it throw off our, our game. Um, so, you know, the hit, yeah, I didn't like whatsoever. As far as the Oilers, they're still a team that they're giving up two goals a game. It's pretty impressive for your Edmonton Oilers. There has not been a forward that has scored. That's right. what I think. Where I think Edmonton, at the end of the day, is still going to be Edmonton. They're going to crumble at a point. But do you think that Dreisaitl didn't get the game misconduct because they had already handed out a game misconduct to an Edmonton Oiler already? No, I think I think it all had to do with it, that it was him, and they didn't want to bring too much to light on it. I mean, that's why I've I haven't heard anybody really commentary on this leaving of the feet, which was the thing that blew me away. Um, You know, and as far as Edmonton, I know, understand how you say Edmonton always crumbles, but usually it's because all of a sudden they're lit up like a Christmas tree. And that hasn't been the case. They've played pretty sound defensively. Game one, they played a perfect road game. Yeah, it's perfect if you win. Right. So almost perfect, okay? Um, and it's just, you know, Bob was better and goaltenders do that occasionally. At the end of the day, Florida has Bob and Edmonton has Stuart Skinner. Um, and that might yes. be truly the deciding factor in this final, um, is coming yeah. down to goaltending. Um, um yeah. but also it'll change a little bit. They're in Edmonton. They now have the opportunity to get Connor McDavid away from Sasha Barkov. They have the opportunity to get him away from maybe even the second line. The problem being their Florida third line, line centers good. A, a Finnish kid who plays really good. <laughs> so even if you get the matchup you want, it's difficult. But they're going to get him away from Sasha Barkov, who is your sulky winner. So it could change up there, especially if Sasha doesn't go and really throws a hammer and everything. But the other thing that the Panthers have playing up in Edmonton is that Edmonton crowd. Because all you need is that first goal. And that's it. You're going to feel the tension in that building of, oh, my God, just like you feel it in Toronto. Just like you feel it in every game. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you do feel the same thing in Toronto where, oh, God, here we go again. We're never going to win. So um, we'll see what happens up there. Um, McDavid has shown his usual flashes. But, again, they've decided, listen, we're going to let you skate all over the perimeter. We're not going to chase after you too much. Once you start coming into the middle and coming closer to the net, then we'll think about it. And he's tried an awful lot to go through three people, and he can't. Um, he's getting frustrated, too. So, unfortunately for them, you know, Evander Kane, whatever you think about him, is their other kind of go-to guy, and he is banged up beyond belief. And, of course, Corey Perry, they figured out, is just worthless. So, um. Maybe they listen to our show. Yeah, maybe. 
But um, they're they're in a hole. All they got to do is win game three. But um, that might be a tall ask. Um, it'll it'll be difficult. They they have to get out to a good start. Yeah. If they, if they don't, it'll just it'll be over, and that'll be that. But um, the rats will rain down in Edmonton. Yeah, and and again, I've. I've liked the way Edmonton has played because it's the first time I've ever seen them. Because in the finals, you have to keep the puck out of the net. If you don't do that, you're just you never you're never going to win. They figured that out. Now they just can't even get the puck in the net. So um, Bob has just turned into like superhuman, which Bob was already superhuman, but like just on like a whole different level. Um, and it's been probably. I you know I'd say the most entertaining thing to watch from any team this postseason is watching Bob in the net for me. Yeah, and that's your um uh, that's your con Smythe winner. As much as you know, maybe. you might want to you well, might want to NHL doesn't like giving con Smythe players to not or to non Canadians. Yeah, I hear you, and they also have a thing with the goaltender that they don't like to. My prime example that I bring up all the time on this is your Eddie Belfour. And all I did was watch Ed Belfour outplay Patrick Waugh or Roy and Dominic Hasek on the way to winning a final and didn't win the con spot. I'm still blown away that that happened. And we all know who Bob has had to go through to beat this, you know, in the cup. So, uh, We'll see more to be, be determined, but uh, it doesn't look good for Edmonton. They got a lot of questions. Um, they'll get a little bit of rest. Their top people have to get going. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. I'm so excited. Um, that is a wrap for this week. Uh, make sure to hit that like and subscribe on either Spotify, Apple Podcast, or YouTube, however you watch or listen to us ramble on a weekly basis. If you have any questions, comments, you want to be on an episode, send us a message, email, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. We're probably on it. And Give we, us a review. Oh, yes, please. Give us a review. We love them. Uh, and we will talk at you guys next week.